In the second meditation, Descartes begins with the conclusion of the first meditation that nothing can be known with certainty. So I can't know anything because of these four sources of doubt. And then he goes on to say, well, but wait a minute. I am still doubting. There's still somebody who's being deceived. Even if all of this is a mistake and I'm imagining I'm being deceived that I'm here in this room and that I'm talking in this way and that I'm hearing these sounds and feeling these feelings and calculating these mathematical equations. Even if all of that is a deception, there's still someone being deceived. So the indisputable truth that Descartes hits upon in the second meditation is that I exist. I still exist. There's someone that exists who is being deceived. And then the question is, well, who am I? What is it that is being deceived? And Descartes says, well, what it is that is being deceived is the thinker. I am, I am thinking. I am being deceived when I exist. Every time I'm thinking thoughts, I am the thing that's ex that I'm, I'm existing. And so he hits upon this formula that is very famous, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So while I'm thinking, I must exist. This is the conclusion, this is the beginning of the second meditation and is what Descartes takes to be the firm foundation of knowledge, of all knowledge, is based on the fact that I exist while I'm thinking. And it's important to recognize what Descartes defines as thinking. It's not just having abstract thoughts or doing mathematics. Thinking includes uh, doubts, understands, affirms, denies, wills, refuses, imagines, and senses. All of those things count as forms of thinking, including imagining and sensing, which will be important later on. So, uh, so your, your sensation is part of your thinking. So even if you're daydreaming, you're not having any abstract concepts, uh, that still counts as the sort of thinking that Descartes has in mind here that affirms that you exist. So any possible contents of your consciousness count as thoughts, according to Descartes, and affirm that that is who you are. So again, here, take a moment and, and think, you know, do you agree that uh, you exist while you're thinking? Uh, does this seem like to you a foundation of absolute knowledge? Is it something that you can count on uh, even when um, everything else might be a deception? Um, and think about whether this counts as what you are essentially. Are you essentially someone that doubts and understands and senses and imagines? Or might you be something else? Uh, what if your capacity for those things disappears? Do you disappear? After establishing that he exists and that he can know that he exists, the next question for Descartes is to try to figure out what else he might possibly know. How else can he establish knowledge uh, on the basis of just this bare fact that he exists? And he thinks it's, it's reason and understanding that is going to be the basis for knowledge. And this is how he gets it. He gets to this conclusion by looking at the wax. Um, this is a famous wax example, and I want you to uh, look at this in your books. Go to section 30. You'll have different editions. The section 30, the section numbers are on the side of the margins, um, you know, and they're designed for these older texts to help you get from various different editions to the same place. So look for section 30 in Meditation 2 um, and you can read along with me about the, the wax example. What Descartes is arguing here is that even our knowledge of bodies is known through understanding and not sensation. That we uh, think that we know things through looking at them and perceiving them, but in fact we know them through reason and understanding. And so this is what he's going to try to prove through the wax example. So section 30, he says, and the paragraph starts, let us consider. 
Let us consider those things which are commonly believed to be the most distinctly grasped of all, namely the bodies we touch and see. Those are the things that we think we know the most, the things that we touch and see. So let's look at that and see if, if that's how we know them. Not bodies in general, mind you, for these general perceptions are apt to be somewhat more confused, but one body in particular. Let us take, for instance, this piece of wax. It has been taken quite recently from the honeycomb. It has not yet lost all the honey flavor. It retains some of the scent of the flowers from which it was collected. Its color, shape, and size are manifest. It is hard and cold. It is easy to touch. If you rap on it with your knuckle, it will emit a sound. In short, everything is present in it that appears needed to enable a body to be known as distinctly as possible. But notice that as I am speaking, I am bringing it close to the fire. Drama. The remaining traces of honey flavor are disappearing. The scent is vanishing, the color is changing, the original shape is disappearing. Its size is increasing. You can't see that through the camera. But it is becoming liquid and hot. You can hardly touch it. And here we can see this maybe if it's burned enough, not quite. There we go, there we go. So it's liquid and hot, it's dripping, it's changing shape. And now when you wrap on it, it no longer emits a sound. And I'm not going to wrap on it, that's pretty hot wax. Does the same wax still remain? I must confess that it does. No one denies it. No one thinks otherwise. So what was there in the wax that was so distinctly grasped? Certainly none of the aspects that I reached by means of the senses. For whatever came under the senses of taste, smell, sight, touch, or hearing, now has changed, and yet the wax remains. So despite all of the sense perceptions of this wax changing when it starts to melt, it's nothing the same. Still, we all agree that it's still wax. So all of the sensory qualities of the wax change when heated, yet the wax remains. So we need to think about, well, what is the wax? How do we know that the wax is still the wax? And so Descartes goes on. Perhaps the wax was what I now think it is. Namely, the wax itself never really was the sweetness of the honey, nor the fragrance of the flowers, nor the whiteness, nor the shape, nor the sound, but instead was a body that a short time ago manifested itself to me in these ways and now does so in other ways. So what I have is the wax that's a body that looks one way, has all of these features in one moment, but then in another moment it has different features. Same thing, two different sets of features. But just what precisely is this thing that I just imagined? Let us focus our attention on this and see what remains after we have removed everything that does not belong to the wax, only that it is something extended, flexible, and mutable. So this is what's left. These are the properties of the wax that make it what it is. When you take away the sweetness and the sound and the color and the shape. But what is it to be flexible and mutable? Is it what my imagination shows it to be, namely that this piece of wax can change from a round to a square shape, or from the latter to a triangular shape? Not at all, for a grasp of the wax is capable of innumerable changes of this sort, even though I am incapable of running through these innumerable changes by using my imagination. So it can't just be that it goes from one thing to the next thing or one thing to the other. It's not just that it drips into, you know, this, this bin in this way because it could be all kinds of things and I, and I can't run through all of them. It remains for me, and I'm skipping a few, a few sentences here, um, down, down about five lines, ten lines. 
It remains then for me to concede that I do not grasp what this wax is through the imagination, through imagining its different perceptions. Rather, I perceive it through the mind alone. The point I am making refers to this particular piece of wax, for the case of wax in general is clearer still. But what is this piece of wax which is perceived only by the mind? So what is it to perceive this by the mind alone? This is the question. Surely it is the same piece of wax that I see, touch, and imagine. In short, it is the same piece of wax I took it to be from the very beginning. But I need to realize that the perception of the wax is neither a seeing, nor a touching, nor an imagining. So he's using this word perception in a way that's not familiar to us. We think of perception as using your, your sensory perception. But he's talking about perceiving by the mind alone, which is a different kind of thing. Nor has it ever been through, you know, these sense perceptions, even though it previously seemed so. Rather, it is an inspection on the part of the mind alone. This inspection can be imperfect and confused, as it was before, or clear and distinct, as it is now, depending on how closely I pay attention to the things in which the piece of wax consists. So, you know, before I just was like wax, you know, whatever, it has these features. That was a kind of confused way of thinking about the nature of the wax. Now I'm looking at it and I'm seeing that it, it changes in all these different ways, that the sense perceptions change. And so now I understand that what the wax really is, I can understand clearly and distinctly that what the wax really is, is this extended, flexible, and mutable body. That's what it is, essentially. And so when I perceive by the mind alone, what I do is make a judgment about its essence, what it is even though it changes its sensory properties. That's what it is to uh, really know what the wax is. It's this judgment about essence. And I do that with my mind alone. I do that with my reason, with my understanding. My sense perceptions give me information that allow the reason to function. You know, they're not useless, uh, but they're not the source of knowledge. Knowledge is what my mind does with that information that the senses yield to me. So again, at the end of the second meditation, after Descartes has talked about how the wax works and how reason works to determine knowledge, uh, think about whether you agree. Is reason the way that you know things for certain? Uh, or do you disagree and think that you sometimes know things by virtue of sense perceptions? Is sense perception most important to knowledge? Is reason most important to knowledge? Uh, do they necessarily interact in a fundamental way? So think about what the claim is here with the, with the wax example and, uh, and look at how it functions as we, as we go forward. Keep in mind that for Descartes, at the end of the second meditation, all he knows for certain is that he exists while he's thinking. That's all he knows for certain. So he's thinking about the, he uses the wax example to think about sensation, to think about bodies, to think about knowledge, uh, to launch him into the third meditation where he will establish a foundation for knowledge. He doesn't, he's not there yet. So all of this stuff about the wax and about sensation, about understanding, is just to soften you up for that later argument. So think about, uh, you know, think about how that is functioning, but realize that he doesn't yet know anything except that he exists while he's thinking. That he might be mistaken about there being wax, he might be mistaken about its, his judgment, about its essence as a body. This is all uh, just preamble for 
establishing that he's not being deceived when he has these clear and distinct perceptions. That's something that's going to happen in meditations three and four and five. Uh, when I talk about meditation six, I will recap some of that argument very briefly for you so you can see where Descartes goes between now, where he doesn't know anything, and later where he tries to prove that bodies in fact do exist. Uh, I'll give you some of that, that um, intermediate argument. Uh, but realize that at this point that Descartes only knows that he exists and he's thinking about how he might know other things and, and he determines that it's through reason that he might know other things. So keep that in mind as we go forward and think about whether you agree or you disagree.